You can page so long to Luke chapter 15. We'll be reading from verses 11 through to the end of the chapter. The parable of the prodigal son. And he, speaking of Jesus, said, There was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe, a severe famine arose in that country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him in, into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring the fattened calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead, and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, look, these many years I have served you and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I may celebrate with my friends. But when the son of yours comes, when the son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, "Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive; he was lost and is found." Let's pray, and then we'll look at this text. A little bit more closely. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this well-known parable. We pray, Lord, that you may speak to us through it, wherever we may find ourselves in it, whether we fall into the category of the younger son or the older son. Please be gracious. Please minister to us. Amen. If you were asked... To describe the lifestyle of someone that was completely lost, in complete rebellion to God, how would you describe them? If you had to try and describe, if I asked you a question, I said, who is further away from God? Which of these two people has less hope of being saved? Who needs more grace? Would you describe Peter? A young man in his early 20s who is no stranger to the bottle. In fact, only a few days earlier, he was hugging a toilet seat at a nightclub because he'd had too much to drink. 
He's no stranger to the ladies either. If he isn't taking a different girl home each night, he's at least making sure that his lust for the opposite sex is being satisfied to some degree, perhaps with pornography. The most frightening thing about Peter is the fact that he does these things with absolutely no shame. In fact, he boasts about his exploits. Or would you describe somebody else? Someone else equally needing the same amount of grace as Peter. Perhaps Mark. He's also a young man in his early 20s, but very different to Peter. Mark is a youth leader, a musician in the church, a Bible study leader, and a passionate pro-lifer. He knows the Bible well, is at many church events, and is passionate about his local church. He loves his local church. He works hard and has always been renowned as a fine student. At school, people think he's amazing. At university, every mother in the church wants her daughter to marry Mark. Yet sadly, despite doing all these things, Mark doesn't love the Lord. The only reason that he has always done these things is because his parents taught him to and he never questioned it. And over the years, he's enjoyed having a good reputation. He's working hard to earn God's favor. He's a guilt-driven guy. He's been working hard his whole life. When studying the parable of the prodigal son, we so easily focus on the son that ran off with his inheritance as opposed to the self-righteous son who was meant to represent the religious leaders of Judah, who Jesus just so happened to be addressing in this parable. In telling this parable, Jesus was not primarily addressing the tax collectors and sinners. He wasn't the primary target, although he was targeting them as well. But the primary target was rather the religious leaders who were criticizing him for eating with Judah's social and religious outcasts. Just look at Luke chapter 15, verse 1 and 2. There's your primary audience. They didn't understand how the Messiah could associate with such a disgusting group of people, especially when he had the opportunity to associate with a respectable group of people such as themselves. This is a parable which teaches us of the mercy of God to those who are undeserving. Whether they are prostitutes or self-righteous legalists. So as we look at this parable this evening, we'll take a look at each son under the following two headings. God is merciful, firstly, to those who come to their senses and return to Him. And secondly, to those who love Him and love what He loves. Before we begin looking at the parable, we must take note that this parable was the third of three parables. Jesus told the crowd in response to the criticism of the religious leaders. The first was the parable of the lost sheep, the second, the lost coin, and the third, the parable of the lost son. They all have a common theme, if you've noticed there. 
of someone losing something of value to them, and when the valuable animal, item, or person was found, they rejoiced along with their loved ones as a result. Just look at Luke chapter 15, verse 6, rejoicing, 7, 9, 10, and verse 32. With that in mind, let us begin looking at the parable of the lost or the prodigal son, beginning with our first point, God is merciful to those who come to their senses and return to him. The parable begins with the youngest son doing something shocking in his culture and something that would even be considered shocking in our own culture. He came to his father and asked him for his, his portion of the inheritance that he would one day receive. And he was asking for it before his dad was dead. This younger son no longer wanted to live under the oppressive authority of his father and wanted to go out into the world to live as he pleased, to let loose the lusts of his heart. He was in a sense telling his dad that he wished he was dead. An inheritance is something you only receive when a parent or a guardian passes away. Can those of you with children here, imagine your child coming to you one day with the following request. Hi mom, hi dad. Could I I please have my inheritance now? I'm I'm getting a little impatient. Uh, You know, uh, couldn't you die sometime soon so I can get what my stuff? Then imagine that child shortly after packing his stuff and moving away with no intention of ever contacting you again. It's not like he's going to go away and be like, oh, I'll phone my parents. You know, they've been good to me. They gave me one. No. Doesn't want to see your face. Hate your guts. That is effectively what the son did. He was effectively wishing that his dad was dead. He then proceeded to move to a distant country, far away from the restraints of his oppressive father. And the result of this was wild living. One of the worst judgments God can put on anybody. Giving them what they want. Probably not too dissimilar to a lot of young people today, which move away from their parents' home after school. And you know what happens? They go wild. As a result of this young man's lack of wisdom and lack of restraint, He spent every cent he had received from his father. He didn't plan for a rainy day. Then a severe famine hit that country, and he was forced to face this terrible situation, this famine, with no family or no wealth. This spoiled rich kid. So he hired himself out to the citizens of the land that he was living in. You see, he went far away. He went to another land. And he hit rock bottom. he He got to such a low point that he was hired to feed pigs. And remember, in this context, he was probably a Jewish boy. And feeding pigs, these dirty animals, was about as low as you were going to get. And things got so bad that he actually longed to eat the pig's food. Eating a pig was a horrible thing for a Jew to do. Now he wants to eat the pig's food. At this point, hitting rock bottom, he came to his senses. He came to the following conclusion and finally understand, understood What a good man his father actually was. 
Just listen to what he says in Luke 15, verse 17 to 19. How many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you, against God. Bear in mind, heaven is often speaking of God, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. Then he made his way back to his father, hoping at the very best to be received back as a servant, as a slave. How many sitting here tonight are suffering because of your rebellion to God's word? How many of you are sitting in a pig's pen because of your own disobedience? Perhaps you grew up thinking the Bible was some archaic book given to man to imprison him. Well, a desire to no longer be restrained by the word of God shows a desire to no longer remain under God's rule at all. And that is rebellion against God. How many of us sitting here have thought that we knew better than God? And today we're sitting in a mess that we made. Many of us in this room have experienced the consequences of our own sinful actions. And I hope are willing to admit that this is a mess that we have made. This is not God's fault. Perhaps you are someone who grew grew up in the church, found Christianity to be a burden, and left the first moment you could because you wanted to do things your own way. And somewhere along the line, things just got out of control. Perhaps you've never had contact with Christianity or the Word of God, and with no guidance have made silly choices. Now your life is in shambles, and you ask yourself, if there is a God, why would He even want anything to do with a rubbish like me? I don't know you what your situation may be, But this beautiful parable teaches us that Jesus does want you, even if your life is a mess. Even if it's a self-made mess. Jesus came to save those who are humble enough to to admit their own sin and to turn to him for the salvation of their soul. Earlier in Luke, Jesus said the following when he asked the same question, when the, when the Pharisees asked the same question at the beginning of Luke chapter 15. He said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, let me just re- read that again, sorry. Those who are well have no need for a physician, but only those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. That's Luke chapter 5, verse 31 to 32. And that's one of the major themes in the book of Luke. If your life is in a mess, and you know it's your own doing, please don't ignore your circumstances. Let your circumstances speak to you. Don't let your circumstances cause you to run further away from God. Let those circumstances point you to the giver of life, the most loving of all fathers. My prayer is that your horrible situation will make you come back to your senses and turn to Christ for forgiveness and for restoration. Just look at what happened when the son came home. Firstly, his dad ran out to him, and before he could even say a word, this father 
lavished him with affection. Then when the son finally had a chance to speak, he couldn't even complete his apology before the father was treating him like a son again. Not merely as a slave. The father calls a feast in honor of his returning son because this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he is found. That's in verse 24. If you can relate to this lost son, take comfort in the following words of Jesus. From John 6 verse 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me. If the Father gives them to me, they will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. Let's look at the second son. Under the heading, God is merciful to those who love him and what he loves. So as this feast was taking place, the older and obviously more responsible brother was working hard in the field. As he was making his way back from the, back from the field towards the house, he saw these festivities. The dad had obviously forgotten to call him. He was just so excited to see the son he thought was dead home. He, was, he didn't even think, oh, I must go. He was just, man, this is the best day of my life. Not knowing what was going on, the, young, the older brother asked one of the slaves, the servants, what's, what's going on there? Why is there such a party mood going on? Maybe he thought, maybe it's a surprise party for me, you know. Well, what a fantastic son I am, you know, laboring out here in the field, late. He was surprised to hear that his worthless brother, who had shamed his family in such a disgusting way, he had returned home. This brother seemed to be a good example of what many would call the, the typical firstborn, the responsible one. Responsible, keenly aware of what was appropriate, and always seeking the approval of the father. He was angry that in all his years of commitment to his father and the hard work around the estate, he had never been honored in such a way. Just listen to what he says. This is in verses 29 to 30. Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and I've never disobeyed your orders. I'm not sure about that. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son, not his brother, when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. Now, as I read that, we must beware of being too critical of this older brother. To him, it seems like his younger brother is being honored for disobedience. While he, him, this person who has worked so hard to please his father, has never received anything like this for his consistent obedience. Many of us have felt this way. Maybe some of us feel that way sitting here in the church. But also remember something else. Was the celebration about the son squandering the money? Was the celebration, was, were they celebrating the, the horrible life that the son had led up to this point? No. What were they celebrating? My son, I thought he was dead and he is alive. This had nothing to do about, uh, with the son from the perspective of 
honoring anybody. It all had to do with the Father. I love this lost child, and he's come home. My child's come home. That was the point of the celebration. Not that he squandered all his father's money. This response by the older son exposes the heart, the sinful heart of him. It shows us that this older son believed that he, re- he deserved everything. That he, He'd worked hard and he deserved everything that was coming to him. It is amazing how quickly people forget how much has been given to them. Remember, these two boys were rich, spoiled brats. Their dad earned the wealth, not them. Everything that the older brother had, had come from the father. And by working hard around the estate, He was working as much for his own benefit as for his dad's benefit. If he worked hard, the estate would grow. And what would happen? He would earn, he would get even more of an inheritance. Everything he had came from the father. You can see that in verse 31. And you can see in verse 31, take note of this. This is a very important fact as you read this passage. People read it and they assume that the, that the, the inheritance is now going to be split in half again. So basically, this older son is now going to have his, new, his inheritance cut in half. That's not the case. The father says, everything that I have is still coming to you. He's getting nothing. He's, it's gone. His inheritance is gone. It looked like this son had sacrificed so much for his father. But based on his response, it seems like he sacrificed a lot, not for his father, but for himself. So he'd get a bigger payout in the end. Maybe his dad was a better businessman than him and he could still learn a thing or two. How many of us are like this older son? How many of us work so hard at developing a good reputation? Regular church attendance. We work hard at our knowledge of God's word. At having a moral lifestyle. And after all of that, we think, I've done pretty well. I think God owes me a thing or two. This can be a major problem both for Christians as well as non-Christians. How often is the thing that keeps us from committing that gross sin, the fear of what others would think of us if they found out? Is the thing that drives you to your, your high standard of morality a desire to not disappoint your Savior? Or is it some form of false piety? How often do we say that we don't want to be a bad witness? We don't want to make Jesus look bad. When in fact, we just don't want to lose our good reputation. We don't want to lose our reputation as that pillar of the community. If the thing that is driving you to live in a biblically consistent manner is fear of man, fear of what other people think of you, or a desire to be honored and not see God honored, as morally as you may be living, as many Christian disciplines as you may be practicing, you are sinning. Just take note of what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 13 verse 3, and that whole section is relevant. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. 
Be warned, a Christianity void of love for God is not Christianity at all. And you know how you know you love somebody? When you rejoice, when they rejoice. They get a degree and you just so overjoyed because this person you love has achieved their goal. Your decrepit old father who's getting on in years and he hasn't had much to smile about for the last, I don't know how many years, been moping around the estate because his beloved son disappeared. And now he suddenly comes walking up the road and you haven't seen the old guy move like that in years. That should bring you joy. Just listen to how gently and lovingly Jesus rebukes the Jewish religious leaders through the Father in the parable for their anger at Jesus' relationship with the Jewish outcasts of, Ju- of Judah, with the religious outcasts of Judah. Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad. It was fitting for this your brother, your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Verse 31 and 32. Just like this father rejoiced at the return of his son, God rejoices when sinners repent and believe in him. If we truly love the Lord, we would rejoice with him when all kinds of people, even the most immoral, are rescued from their sin and begin worshiping Jesus. The parable ends with this appeal from the father to the oldest son. With Jesus appealing to the Jewish religious leaders to repent of their lack of love, first of all for God, and their lack of love for these lost sheep that they were meant to be caring for. The lost sheep of Israel, they were busy sitting there. Their lives in a mess. They should have longed to see these people coming to salvation. And they also needed to repent of the fact that they believed that honor was owed to them for their their good conduct. And in reality, they had only done what God had asked of them. They hadn't done anything extraordinary. In fact, they had failed. They had broken the law. Sadly, those who chose to reject Jesus' appeal at the end of this parable, it's left open-ended. How is the older son going to respond to this rebuke from the father? We see the response of the, the younger brother, but the older brother, we don't see the response. And it's because it's directed at these religious leaders. And how are you going to respond? They, those who chose to reject Jesus' appeal and continue in their self-righteous anger, they remained lost. But all of the self-righteous religious leaders who humbled themselves, repented of their sin, and trusted in Jesus alone were saved. And Nicodemus is an example of that in the book of John. Then empowered by the Holy Spirit, I have no doubt those men would have rejoiced at every convert that Jesus won. Because those who love God love what He loves. Let me give you a personal example, and I'll close with this. My brother and I were a perfect example of this. I was basically the the hardworking Christian kid. I didn't drink. I've never been a drinker. Don't even like the taste of alcohol. I didn't smoke. I didn't mess around with women. And in comparison to my brother, I was an absolute saint. I'm not going to go into too much detail about my brother's lifestyle. 
In comparison to many others, I'm sure he wasn't that bad. But in comparison to me, he was an absolute nightmare. One evening, uh, my brother and I would go out regularly. I would basically drive him. So we'd go somewhere together. He'd drive there and I'd drive home because he'd be too drunk to um, come home. And, and I liked going to bed at a certain time, so I would get very frustrated. But one night, I'd had just about enough of him. So what I did, my brother was, he was finished. He was as drunk as I'd ever seen him be. I left him at a party. I'd had enough. I said, the people at this party can deal with him. I'm not dealing with him. He can go sleep somewhere else. I don't care. I just lost it. So I left him at the party. At that point, my brother was so drunk, he was sitting over a bucket, puking into it. And he was just sitting there, staring at his vomit at the bottom of this bucket. And the Lord turned his world around and turned my brother into a new man. He, he sat there looking at this, at this vomit and he said to himself, what am I doing with my life? I know the truth. Why am I rebelling against God? And he was saved. It was real. I knew that guy. And I saw the next day, there was a change. We were attending different churches at the time. I was attending the Anglican church. And my brother was at attending an Assemblies of God at the time. And um, I used to visit his church in the evenings. Because even though I was generally quite a moral guy, I did like pretty girls. And that church had a lot of them. And people at this church took a note of this change in him, and they were praising the Lord for it. But they also knew I was a legalistic little jerk. And um, I came into this church, and of course they tried to convert me. <laughs> they didn't think very much of me at that church. And I didn't care because at my church, people thought the world of me. They were like, this guy's going to one day be in the ministry. He's just like his father, the priest at the church. He's the smart son. He actually knows what he's talking about. When people at his church would try to convince me of my need to be born again, I'd tell them that I read the Bible more than them, which I did. And I lived a more moral life than them. And in some cases, I did. Who were they to tell me anything about God? If they knew what a righteous man I was, they would praise me. They wouldn't praise that worship leader up there. They don't know what he was. I wish someone would have just said to me, Andrew, it doesn't matter what you do. You don't love Jesus. By the grace of God, I was saved just a year or so later when Jesus showed me that my good works were not earning me any righteousness. In fact, my good works were condemning me because I was doing them for my own glory so that I could earn my own salvation. I didn't think I needed God to save me. Now I knew I needed him to save me. In September 2004, I was saved at a scripture union camp that I arranged where the gospel was preached. For the first time in my life, I knew what it meant to love Jesus and to be transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. May the Lord continue to save all kinds of people for the glory of his name. Whether it is horrific sinners staring at a pool of vomit at the bottom of a bucket or a self-righteous jerk in an Assemblies of God church. And may we never fail to rejoice at every sinner 
who turns to Christ for the forgiveness of their sins. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the relevance of it. We thank you, Lord, that this parable left nobody safe. Lord, your desire in this parable was to reach out to the lost sheep of Israel, whether that was the prostitutes and the tax collectors. And Lord, you also sought to reach out to the Pharisees and the scribes. You are so gracious. Thank you for saving so many sitting in this room this evening. Please deliver us from any form of entitlement where we believe you owe us anything. May we serve you with willing hearts, knowing that if you gave us nothing in return, you would still be more than fair to us. You would be gracious to us because you've granted us salvation. Lord, if someone is sitting here and they are not saved and they fall into any one of the categories of these two brothers, please save them. Please be gracious. Amen.